Welcome to a TRL podcast. The Research for Community Access Partnership, RECAP, is a six-year program of applied research and knowledge dissemination funded by UK Aid for the UK Department of International Development, DFID. The overall aim is to promote safe and sustainable rural access in Africa and Asia through research and knowledge sharing between participating countries and the wider community. Card No Emerging Markets UK Limited has been contracted by DFID to manage RECAP. There are two components under RECAP, the Africa Community Access Partnership and the Asia Community Access Partnership. AFCAP works in 12 African countries, ASCAP works with five countries in South Asia. Existing guidelines and documentation such as the TRL Overseas Road Note series and the South African Technical Recommendations for Highways, which are commonly used by practitioners in Sub-Saharan Africa and, to a lesser extent, Asia, are in many cases outdated and do not reflect recent research findings. As part of the RECAP Way Forward Strategy approved by RECAP member countries and DFID, the development of a series of technical notes or guidelines was identified to address the shortcomings. Today we launched the first Rural Road Note, RRN, a guide to the application of pavement design methods for low-volume rural roads. This was prepared by TRL. The RRN gives guidance to practitioners on how to select and apply pavement design methods for low-volume rural roads. Broadly, this podcast aims to tackle two themes. Firstly, why is it that large parts of the rural road network of low- and middle-income countries, LMICs, is mostly earth and gravel instead of bituminous or concrete? Secondly, how do we effectively increase rural accessibility in LMICs and reduce poverty and support rural socioeconomic development through provision of sustainable, resilient, rural road infrastructure to the rural communities? Today, I am joined by Andrew Otto and Kenneth McCura of TRL. Perhaps we can start by asking you to introduce yourself. I am Andrew Otto, a Principal International Consultant at the Transport Research Laboratory in the United Kingdom. I'm a Chartered Engineer with 18 years experience in the field of civil engineering, materials, pavements and research. And I am the TRL team leader for the delivery of the project on the development of this rural road node. I'm Engineer Kenneth Mukura. I'm a civil engineer and I work for TRL uh, in the UK, but mostly on the international team. Um, my areas of specialty um, include uh, pavement design, materials, hydrology and drainage, climate change, uh, capacity building and training. And um, uh, on this project, um, I am uh, the rural road uh, uh, expert and I'm one of the key authors. In terms of the RRN, how do you define road pavement and what are road pavement design methods? Um, The general understanding uh, in the community of the pavement is that it's a footway and This differs uh, very much from what the engineering community defines a pavement as. In the engineering community, a pavement is a horizontal structure on which vehicles operate. So they include anything from unpaved roads up to motorways. They even include airport runways, industrial aprons, and footways and cycleways. Now, 
pavements can be categorized as unpaved or paved. And unpaved pa uh, pavements are made up of soil and gravel, whereas paved pavements are made up of asphalt or concrete, or they can be elemental in terms of uh, bricks and block pavers. Now, the focus of the rural road node is on rural road pavements, and this can be both unpaved or paved. Now, because of the traffic stresses or traffic effects that are endured by the various materials that our pavements are made up of, and because of environmental effects on these materials, different institutions have come up with various methods of designing these materials or specifying their quality and their quantity in terms of thickness so that the damage of both traffic and the environment is minimized. Now, in the Rural Road Note, we deal with six of these design methods which cover different conditions and require different uh, materials. Uh, I must emphasize that the methods we deal with here are empirically developed, and that means they were developed for a certain set of conditions under which uh, they would be guaranteed to perform well. So it is therefore imperative that in applying any of these methods, one understands their limitation and areas of application clearly. Kenneth, how do you define a low volume road? That is a good question. There are many different perceptions when it comes to low volume roads. Um, now, how do you define it? Uh, is it about the number of people that are using that road? Is it the number of vehicles? Is it the traffic composition? You know, there are a lot of mixes like um, the non-motorized traffic, the motorized traffic, uh, heavy vehicles, light vehicles. Or is it how the road is designed and built? And how do how can people tell um, the difference between a low volume road and a high volume road? And is the definition the same everywhere? And these are the uh, things that people have been discussing or uh, um, technocrats and practitioners uh, dealing with low volume roads have been discussing these um, aspects. So the perception is different when it comes to low income countries and high income countries. What can be perceived as a low volume road in a low income country um, and, and, and as a low volume road in a uh, high income country, the perception is quite different. So when it comes to um, defining a low volume road, um, a consensus has been reached by the practitioners. And in that consensus, a low volume road is defined primarily by the amount of loading that is carrying. So when we're talking about traffic loading, we are talking about um, the axle loads and how much of those axle loads that the road can carry before it fails or through its life. And as, as you know, um, different vehicles and different axles have got different loads. So that has to be um, uh, uh, calculated on the basis of a standard. And that standard is what we call uh, an equivalent axle load. Um, so the, an equivalent axle load, uh, standard axle load, is one that is eight tons. So all the axle loads that pass through um, the road are then converted to the equi equivalent standard axle load. Now, it's the accumulation of these axle, uh, axle loads that is now used uh, to determine how much uh, a road can carry. 
Now, uh, in, as far as the definition is concerned, what we have, we have put in the rural road note, uh, the limit, the upper limit of the traffic loading uh, is 1 million standard access for low volume roads. And anything below that, that is what you consider is a low volume road. Anything above that is actually categorized as high volume. Um, then the other issue is basically the traffic volume. The traffic volume typically, um, it, it should be around 300, 400 vehicles per day. That's the typical limit uh, of low volume roads and anything below that is categorized as low volume. Above that is high volume. But this is a secondary factor in the sense that uh, when the conditions are right, you can have much higher traffic volumes. Um, and as long as the specification for the loading is satisfied, that is considered a, a low volume road. In addition to that, a uh, low volume road is defined in terms of the materials that are used. And it is important to consider that um, the idea uh, behind this rural road note is to make sure that we use locally available materials. And in doing that, uh, a lot of research has been carried out to determine what sort of materials can be used uh, to, in order to minimize the cost of provision of low volume roads. So uh, where we can use locally available materials, even those that not meet uh, conventional specifications, that is how we define a, a low volume road. So there are different aspects to it. Um, so. In LICs especially, uh, this is the definition that, that is used. Uh, that is the traffic loading, which is the primary one uh, aspect of the definition, and then the traffic volume, and then the design aspects, including the materials as well. And then what is rural in this case? Rural is um, uh, any section any section of road that is outside the boundaries of uh, urban settings, where the specifications and conditions that are applied in urban settings um, uh, do not apply, like speed, for example. If you've got 60 kilometers per hour, then outside the boundaries, then you can increase to more than 60, and also the geometric design and, the, and everything else. So this is how a low volume road is defined. Andrew, what is the rural road note? For instance, is it a book, a guideline, or a manual? In uh, the area of civil engineering, there are three uh, main kinds of documents that are used. The first one are manuals. The second one includes guidelines, and the third ones are specifications. Now, manuals, as uh, contain a set of uh, well laid out instructions to follow. They generally don't give a lot of explanation about the context surrounding those instructions. And there's little room to deviate from the instructions. And this is done for the purpose of guaranteeing uh, quality, that is the quality of the road that is to be produced. And because of this uh, strict set of instructions, sometimes you can uh, benefit from savings and in other times they can turn out very costly if the instructions don't match the conditions for which the road is being designed. Now, on the other hand, guidelines tend to offer more context or more explanations around the context so that practitioners understand the context around the instructions that are provided, for example, in a manual. Now, when the practitioners have more understanding, they can therefore make uh, an informed decision or deviation from that set of instructions. And generally, guidelines will support manuals or they enhance manuals. But guidelines can also stand alone, as in they offer the same instructions with more explanations. 
Uh, specifications, on the other hand, are generally very strict and they provide the quality or define the quality of the product that is either to be used or to be delivered. In this case, the materials that are used on a road or the road itself. And you cannot, as a designer, deviate from this specification unless you've got the authority of the owner of the road, which can be our local councils or our highways authorities. Now, the Rural Road Note is a guideline for the application of pavement design methods. So it enables practitioners to make a better application of the pavement design methods that are generally included in their manuals. And the way in which the development of the guideline came about in this case, the Rural Road Note, is that some of the 17 RECAP participating countries, RECAP stands for Research for Community Access Partnership. So some of the 17 participating countries requested that they needed further guidance on the methods included in their manuals. And so TRL was engaged to prepare uh, this guideline in the form of a rural road note. Now, a stakeholder working group was constituted in order to represent the views of the various stakeholders involved in delivery of uh, rural roads. And aside from that, a technical panel uh, was also regularly reviewing the output of the authors uh, of the Rural Road Note. And finally, the Rural Road Note was reviewed by an independent peer reviewer, and a lot of effort was put in to produce a quality document. All of this is towards enhancing uh, DFID's goals of community development. So what should the practitioners expect from the RRN? The Rural Road Note uh, contains a detailed uh, description of the applicability as well as the limitation of the common six pavement design methods used in the design of rural roads. Now, most country manuals will contain at least three of these pavement design methods. And therefore, the challenge to the practitioner is when and how should I choose which method to apply? Now, the Rural Road Note provides guidance to the practitioner on which method to use for a specific set of conditions. It also provides extensive advice on the limitations of each of those methods so that a practitioner knows how far he can deviate within any given set of instructions. Now, there is also extensive advice on the use and modification of locally available materials and these are materials that had previously been deemed unsuitable or non-appropriate for the construction of low volume roads. But the standard that had been used to deem these materials unsuitable was the high volume road standards. Therefore, it was not appropriate for low volume roads. Now, with a new set of standards for low volume roads, the specifications for appropriate materials have been developed and these are contained in the Rural Road Note and details of how to modify your materials to adhere to these are included in the Rural Road Note. Now, a large part of the road network 
in low and middle income countries are still mostly earth and gravel. And this, as we know, when they're subjected to traffic action, vehicle action, and the environmental conditions such as rain and, and heat and so on, they will deteriorate quite fast as compared to uh, bituminous materials or concrete. So the aim of this rural road note is to allow practitioners to select materials that are appropriate to their conditions so that they can have rural roads that are longer lasting and therefore economical in, in lifetime terms. And with this, it then promotes the effective increase in rural accessibility in uh, the low and middle income countries. And when accessibility is increased or improved, you have a reduction in, in poverty. So that is what uh, practitioners should expect from the rural road node. Who were the stakeholders and how were they involved in the whole process? Uh, first, I'd like to recognize um, uh, the immense uh, support that uh, DFID has got into this and the delivery of this um, rural road knot. Because as you know, the rural road knot is basically an end product. And the information that is going into this road knot is basically an accumulation of all the research that has been carried out uh, to provide the evidence that is required to develop this rural road mode. And DFID has financed um, a lot of research projects uh, through the RECAP uh, program and many other platforms. And I also like to recognize um, Cadno, who are managing the a recap program and um, yeah when it comes to the actual production of uh, uh, the, the rural road nodes um, we had quite a number of uh, authors and contributors in the actual drafting um, we had uh, Andrew Otto uh, Andrew Otto who has uh, introduced himself already and um, he was the team leader on this project. And we have uh, Dr. John Roach, who is one of the top experts in road design and in many other road aspects of road provision. Um, I was uh, in there also supporting and as a one of the key um, authors then we had um, Dr. Sarah Reeves, um, because everything we do um, nowadays with the documents and everything, uh, we have to make sure that we include climate change, um, the climate uh, change impacts, uh, mitigation, and so forth. So Dr. Sarah Reeves is a top expert in this, and uh, she made some very important contributions to this roadmap. Um, there's also um, Dr. John Hein, who is a transport economist. Uh, we had to bring in all the costs and 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 value aspects uh, into the document uh, because this is very important in terms of how the practitioners will apply the concepts in the rural road uh, Then we have uh, engineer Liam Senero. Uh, she is a geotechnical expert, and we had to bring in this expertise into the into the document because we're dealing with a lot of materials uh, and other geotechnical aspects. So yeah, so the authors, um, as you can see, brought in a very wide range of expertise in order to uh, produce a high quality document. Then we have um, uh, the countries um, that contributed significantly to the money, uh, to, to the roadmap. 
um, and we have got 17 countries here from Africa and Asia. And um, they helped in, in the time when we were developing the content uh, because they will be the end users anyway, and they are the main beneficiaries. So they contribute a lot uh, during the production of this uh, road note. Uh, then we have uh, the stakeholder uh, working group, which uh, was sort of representing the different entities uh, that are involved in low volume road provision. And this includes uh, road authorities, uh, the consulting firms uh, with regards to the designs and so forth, and the academia. So in the... Uh, uh, group of stakeholders, we have uh, Dr. Deng Tran, and uh, she is from Vietnam and was uh, representing uh, the academia um, uh, from the University of Hanoi. And then we have uh, Dr. Jasper Cook representing consultants in, in Asia. Uh, we have uh, Engineer Michael Peanut, who is also um, a, a well-known consultant in low volume road provision in Africa. Uh, we have uh, engineer Kulolego Letter, was representing uh, the program management unit of RECAP. Then we have uh, Dr. Patrick Bekoy. Um, who is uh, from Department of Federal Roads in Ghana. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Tony Greening, who is very well known in the uh, field of research. He was a former uh, TRL, uh, but now he's uh, retired. But he is uh, one of the main drivers of the concepts of low volume roads. Then we had um, uh, engineer Richard Mugenyi from the Ministry of Works and Transport in Uganda, and then Engineer Rubina Nomaramid uh, from the National Road Administration, ENI, in Mozambique. And as you can see, in terms of um, the stakeholder working group, it was a mix uh, because we needed this to, to help bring in all aspects and all the challenges that they're facing in order to be able to address those challenges in the in the uh, rural road note. Then we also had just uh, practitioners in general who also contributed significantly um, to the development of the road note. And um, then we had a, a, an independent peer reviewer uh, as a Gordon Keller, um, because we needed that uh, over, over, Arching te technical assessment to make sure that uh, the content and the quality of the output, um, which is the road road not, is uh, it meets um, international standards. So as you can see, this um, whole pro project was actually demand driven. Uh, it came from the practitioners that they wanted this uh, document to be able to apply the principles uh, that are appropriate for the provision of low volume roads. And um, uh, this combination actually helped to make it easy and to bring in all the evidence and the knowledge to be able to develop this rural road map. In a nutshell, Andrew, can you explain to the listeners uh, what valuable information is provided in the RRN? And in what circumstances should practitioners make reference to it? Um, low and middle income countries face a number of challenges in terms of road provision. Uh, one of the main challenges that are faced by these countries is the rising cost of road construction and maintenance. Now, this is partly attributed to the application of material specifications meant for high volume roads to low volume roads. Now, 
in this regard, it has meant that a number of materials that would be suitable for the provision of low volume roads have been previously rejected. And that has meant that the cost of providing these roads has been way up, and therefore most of the roads that are in the rural areas in these countries have remained earth and gravel, which are not durable under the actions of uh, vehicles and uh, environmental aspects such as rain. So the Rural Road Note provides very good guidance on how to select appropriate materials for low volume rural roads and the need for the countries also to keep refining and updating some of the performance requirements or uh, the performance results of the materials that they use so that they constantly strive to achieve better performance at an appropriate cost. And this in turn would allow for durability and hence an expansion of the road network. Now, the Rural Road Note contains advice on when to use which pavement design methods and what are its limitations. There is very good guidance on how to make low volume roads uh, climate resilient. And there's also a lot of uh, examples of how to carry out economic analysis so that the practitioners can learn how to justify their choice of a, a pavement or to choose which of the pavements that they have designed is the most economical so that there's value for money for uh, the financier of these uh, projects. So we also have, uh, of course, other aspects such as uh, dealing with uh, slope stability, how to minimize landslides and so on, which are, are very crucial in areas that are mountainous and, and suffer from a lot of these problems. Now, the rural road node can be used during planning for new roads or upgrading of existing roads. It can also be a reference material for training purposes. And it can also be used during the design of the existing roads together with the country manuals. And it helps, the economic tools in it helps to present clearly to financiers that the decisions of which technology to go with has been taken in an economically judicious way so that uh, accessibility, rural accessibility in low and middle income countries can be improved and poverty reduced. How will this RRN benefit the LICs, MICs, development partners and practitioners in general, and more importantly, policy makers? Yeah, that's a very good uh, question. Um, first of all, let's look at uh, what are the challenges. The challenges are that in these uh, uh, low-income countries, um, the largest part of the networks, uh, road networks, are low-volume roads. And these are the roads that support economic development in the rural communities. And when you look at the um, the policies, the foreign policies of the British government, and also um, the UK aid and DFID in particular, uh, the idea is to assist these uh, communities, some of which are marginalised, to be able to participate in the national, regional, and economic development um, uh, initiatives in many of these countries um, and regions. And basically, the idea that is really encompassing what we've put 
uh, in the rural roads is basically to do with making rural road um, sustainable. Rural road provision has to be sustainable. And in, in, in order to achieve that, we have to make sure that we're able to reduce the cost of construction. We have to reduce the maintenance demand on these roads. That's why you find in most cases there's a massive backlog. Uh, and once we are able to provide a sustainable uh, rural road infrastructure, then we know that we'll be able to impact positively uh, on the rural communities in terms of the socioeconomic development, uh, reduction of poverty, um, facilitating you know, effective responses. Like for example, we've had COVID-19 and, and definitely it is important to make sure that accessibility is guaranteed throughout the year. Um, so these are some of the things that, you know, the communities will benefit from. Um, and how this has been incorporated in the rural roadmap is that we are looking at how we can use some of uh, the locally available materials, um, like those materials that could not be used. And in most cases, if you use conventional specifications, it means you have to sometimes get your material from very long distances, and it makes the cost of construction of these uh, low volume roads uh, expensive. And so we're looking at how we can accommodate that. Now we are able to uh, use even the fine sense, which could not be used, the laterites, um, you know, things like macadam uh, bases, Telford bases. They are pl in places in many countries where they've got very coarse gravels and those would be rejected because they don't meet uh, standard specifications or conventional specifications. But now those materials can be used and this will greatly reduce the costs of rural road provision. Um, and also it, in that uh, token, we are trying to make sure that the rural road networks are climate resilient and, and that climate resilience can be applied in a, an economic and viable manner. And therefore, the road node gives all this, uh, this guidance and is basically developed from evidence that has been developed through research. In terms of the RRN, what were the challenges faced in its development? Are the recommendations evidence-based? Yeah, the rural road node was developed uh, using input from several stakeholders. And as you can imagine, that comes with a lot of different views and opinions about certain things. And as such, we often ended up with several heated uh, technical debates uh, among us, the various working groups. But all this was for the good of developing a, a good evidence-based uh, rural road node. Now, of course, we also had to consult a lot of uh, various documents and recent research findings and harmonizing all of these uh, was quite a challenge. But in the end, we had a good document which is based on evidence, research and sound practice. So how can the practitioners and other stakeholders get access to this document? And what is required, for example, registration, payments, etc.? The Rural Road Note is a very useful document, which I encourage practitioners to have and use on a daily basis. Now, you can obtain a free copy from the RECAP website, which is www.researchforcap.org. You can download a soft copy from this website free of charge. You don't need to register any account. You simply need to click download and you have it. Now, other practitioners are going to receive uh, printed copies of the Rural Road Note. And in addition, we have got training videos on how to use and apply uh, some of the principles in the Rural Road Note. You can 
access these videos from the recap youtube handle where you can watch the videos and learn how to apply some of these principles kenneth will the document be regularly updated to keep up with research and development yeah that's a very good question um actually i'm glad to have uh, grown up um uh, in TRL, basically, uh, which is uh, one of the top uh, research organizations. And uh, that has helped me to uh, uh, appreciate the importance of research in resolving many challenges that um, uh, our practitioners are facing out there. Um, at the moment, um, there's a lot of research that's uh, going on. And uh, there are a lot of trials that were uh, built in many countries uh, that participated in the RECAP program. And uh, these uh, trial sections are actually being monitored and we're collecting data. Um, there, there's also um, a, a lot of uh, interest in research right, right, right now in the LICs. Um, and during this uh, RECAP program, um, a, a number of uh, research centers were established in the uh, road administrations and in the departments of roads and the ministries uh, to be able to spearhead research um, in low volume roads. And, um, and there, there, there are a lot of things, a lot of unknowns that uh, we still have to look into. And, and basically, one of the key aspects is that you know, with this changing climate, there's need for an even more considered research to make sure that we are able to develop the solutions that help to make uh, the rural road networks um, uh, more climate resilient. Uh, and uh, basically, once that research is carried out, it has to be uh, contained somewhere, which is basically the uh, rural road node. And um, there, there's also a, a lot of other challenges, basically like the bitumen. Um, we're having serious problems at the moment that the quality of bitumen um, is actually uh, going down. The reason being that um, because of the restrictions, environmental strict restrictions, our bitumen is not supposed to have high contents of volatiles, which then become fumes during construction that uh, go into uh, the air and uh, contaminate the air sometimes and increase the greenhouse gases. So we have to use bitumen that has got lower volatiles, but the downside of it is that that kind of bitumen does not perform very well. So we need to carry out a lot of research around this. Um, and uh, I'm glad that uh, most of the development partners uh, and the governments they realize that research is very, very important. And the research in low volume roads, I think is gonna uh, go a notch higher. And we, we do appreciate the understanding that is there now between the uh, governments, the practitioners, uh, the partner countries, and also the financiers. Um, so we expect that there's going to be a lot of money going into research. Uh, and therefore, the requirement for this rural road not to be updated is uh, is much more important now than ever before. So do you both have any final thoughts on the launch of the RRN? My final thoughts on this are that um, practitioners should continuously make use of this document, but they should also remember that most of the methods in the document were empirically developed and they as practitioners should continue in research in refining some of these methods so that it's fully customized for their environment and in turn to promote the provision of low volume rural roads. Yeah, um, this uh, rural road note is um, an important tool in the toolkit of uh, um, 
all the documents that uh, have been produced, uh, including the low volume road manuals and other guidelines. Um, and uh, practitioners uh, should uh, apply the principles and also give feedback in order for to make this document dynamic because it has to be improved with time. Well, let's end with a thank you for talking to us today. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Thank you.